AI is a technology that can be and will be awesome. What it's not currently is a way to take over the world and kill off humanity, which a lot of large AI companies will want you to, to believe. And that's purely because they want to sell more AI. So the more they tell you how powerful it is and it's going to take over the world, the more AI they sell. Welcome to Tech Talks, hosted by myself, David Savage, and powered by Nash Squared. Today I'm joined by Simon Bain. He is the Omni Index CEO, and we're going to be talking all about AI. Yes, again, but also blockchain, um, because Simon's um, assertive about the fact that actually 2024 is going to be the year that blockchain is going to take off. Anyway, to join me on today's show, I've got George Lynch, who's up in our Glasgow office. How are you? I'm very good, Dave. Good to see you again. Yeah, and I say that you're in our Glasgow office. Of course, this is going out on Good Friday, so I very much doubt that you'll be in our Glasgow office on Good Friday. Yeah, I'll be taking that well on break like I hope many people are. It's been a very busy start to the year for lots of people in lots of roles. So if you're yeah. a listener, then I hope you have a good, a good time off, a good Easter break. I'm going to be driving down to my mum and dad's on Friday um, to spend a long Easter weekend with them. Any plans for Easter? So like a lot of people, uh, we now uh, Christmas presents take the form of um, vouchers and tokens for things. So Easter's typically mm -hmm. the first time we can actually, you know, make use of them. So I think I'm going out for dinner uh, on the back of one of one of those Christmas uh, vouchers that was given. So looking forward to that and maybe uh, spend some time in uh, not my hot tub, but the uh, hot tub of my uh, mother and father-in-law. So very grateful for that as well. Oh, weather weather nice. dependent. I know. Weather dependent, of course, oh, in Scotland. No, yeah. There is, of course, that. I'm, I'm going to be in South France, so the weather is probably slightly more favourable. Yeah, you've got a good chance. Maybe you don't need the hot tub. <laughs> no, no. But um, at the same time, I will be feeling probably quite sick because my parents very much go in for Easter chocolate in a oh, big, big way. Yeah. Well, I've got, bad, I've got yeah, French, French chocolate. Mm, yeah. Quite rich. Yeah. It's a different gravy. <laughs> mm. Anyway, that's on one side. Um, if you celebrate Easter, happy Easter. If you don't, and this is just an opportunity to have a break with family, we'll have a lovely time with your family. And to anyone listening elsewhere in the world, if it, even if it's not a holiday period for you, we hope that you are well. We'll hand over to the interview with Simon and we'll be back with some comments afterwards. Today, I'm joined by Simon Bain, the Omni Index CEO. How are you today? I'm very good, thank you very much. Bright, sunny day out there, so can't complain. It is, it is actually nice after the weather we've been getting battered by um well look I, I was lucky enough to meet you actually cast our minds back to a very sunny pleasant week it, it was um whilst we were at IFA. the weather was very good um it was gorgeous oh, memories of summer hopefully not too far away that we begin to get weather like that again um but we met at IFA. you were there um uh exhibiting in their startup space do you want to tell us a little bit more about who Omni Index are and why you were there and what you've been up to since? Yeah, so Omni Index um, is a, a startup, as you right say. We produce a Web3 platform for data storage. Um, and by Web3, we mean blockchain. So we have a, a blockchain which is homomorphic. Um, that means that you can search the encrypted data without decrypting it. And it is blockchain, which means it's completely immutable and doesn't suffer from ransomware attacks and the like from that. We were at IFA because we were asked to go um, by the, the startup groups there. We were asked to exhibit our products. So we did and found it very, very useful. It's not the normal show we would go to because we're not uh, consumer focused. We're more business focused, but we found it incredibly useful and um, very fruitful for us. Well, that's good to hear because sometimes I, I do question uh what a, a smaller business might get from going to a conference like that where it's so huge and it's very possible to perhaps get overlooked if you are not in the right place and there are thousands of other kind of exhibitors around so really positive it was it was a, a good it experience. was I, I think they did it really well because they had the area purely for startups mm -hmm. so we didn't get mixed up with the likes of i don't know fujitsu and Siemens and all the rest of them. We were in our own big hall, but still in our own hall, which means the people coming in were there to see startups, which was really, really handy. Let me ask you a question. I've just got back from CES at the beginning of January. 
Lucky you. Now, I don't know whether that was a was that was that a genuine said lucky you. No. <laughs> um, look, where are going with this question? This year, CES was all about AI. Last year, it was yeah. about Web three and blockchain. <laughs> Feels like the narrative has moved on a little bit from Web three and blockchain onto AI in terms of media coverage and and where the conversation's at. Is that potentially actually quite helpful that the focus has been taken off and allowing you to quietly get on with things? It could be. Um, my my concern on that is is that it screws up AI. Um, so AI is a technology that can be and will be awesome. What it's not currently is a way to take over the world and kill off humanity, which a lot of large AI companies will want you to, to believe. And that's purely because they want to sell more AI. So the more they tell you how powerful it is and it's going to take over the world, the more AI they sell. Um, my concern to say is that it's going to screw up the whole AI market, which is still young, which is still being developed, and which has huge potential. And I don't just mean in creating a new image or creating an email for you. I mean in being able to ascertain and new drugs for illnesses, finding out genomes um, for completely different species. All of these are, are really, really vital things that AI can, can do. The way that the market is currently focused on AI means that people are expecting it to do everything today. And when it doesn't, the, the money people will pull out. Whether that helps us, I'm not sure it does. Um, because while we can get on and do our stuff quietly and while Web3 will turn into mainstream this year, um, I think currently the focus being that it was on Web3 last year and is on AI this year means that it could actually say to people, well, Web3 was a fad last year, just like AI is a fad this year, so therefore we're not going to. So that, that's my concern. You say there, though, that Web3 could become the mainstream this year. Oh, will will become mainstream. Right. What what's that based on? If you don't mind me asking, that might be a horribly naive question. But but no, why, it's not naive at all. So it's through my own naivety. Um, if you look at where security is, um, and people seem to have forgotten that security is quite important as they rush to get Gen AI into place. But if you look at where security is. Web3 hits that market fantastically. And once people realize what's going on with Web3 as the year progresses, they'll understand that actually Web3 technologies enable their security implementations to go forward. That's why I believe it will become mainstream. Going back many, many, many years, um, if you remember the XML fad, which you probably don't, you might be too young, um, but XML was all over the shop back in... 1999, 2000, whenever it was. Um, and it lasted a whole year as that fad. But if you look at every single application today, they all have XML in the background. JSON comes as a slimmed down version of XML. And it's become mainstream. And that will happen with Web3 as we go through. The storage products, the messaging products will all end up being a Web3 architect without anybody realizing it. One of, the, one of the problems perhaps with Web3 a year ago, one of the reasons that was given for it losing momentum was, was a lack of um, valuable, useful, real-world business cases. Do you, huh. you, you've talked there a little bit about security. Is, is that where some of these might come from, where people uh, will I, be able to hang their hat and go, this is what it's doing for business? It's certainly one area that it can be used for, um, but I do believe you're right. I mean, the, the problem Web3 has got is cryptocurrencies. So, you know, putting my market directly in place now, people don't want to be associated with pyramid selling. They don't want to be associated with scammers. And they hear all the time about uh, cryptocurrencies being hacked. And so they say, oh, Web3. And it's not until you look into it and you realize it's actually not the back-end architecture of the Web3 side and the crypto that's being hacked, the blockchain side. It's actually the wallets that, you're putting all your um, 
your user credentials, your keys into. They're being hacked. And so once people overcome that and they realize that Web3 has security implications, good security implications, Web3 can help your security policy. And by being immutable, it means that you are securing your data against being changed, updated, and screwed about with. That is why I think it will become part of the processing going forward. Mm. I'm hoping it was this year. I believe it will be this year. If you look back at various trends, how long they've taken, um, then I believe it will come in this year. I might be wrong. I am concerned that the whole thing on AI means that people say, yeah, but that was last year's fad. Look at this year's fad. That's failing away. Therefore, I, I'm hopeful that that won't happen. And I do believe it'll end up being ubiquitous. You talk there about that um, provenance that Web3 can give you. And, and, and one of the things I've always thought was, was curious is that we do talk about this lack of, lack of real world examples. And yet over the years through these tech talks, I've spoken to companies who have seemingly had really good user cases. Um, yeah. Uh, around using a ledger whether it's provenance when it comes to precious materials or through art whether it's being able to to determine that um, charitable donations get to the source that you want them to get to Um, i've spoken to businesses where they're looking at kind of property uh, and trying to kind of rebuild um, the property market and and how those properties are listed online in a way that isn't tied up with a with a monopoly effectively what are you doing? What are Omnidex doing? Omni Index, rather, sorry, doing uh, with uh, Web three that that adds to that and specifically demonstrates here's a really strong user case. Um, well, one large project we're doing in Nigeria is working with the schools and the school data there. Uh, so all the school data goes into the blockchain um, because it's immutable. It means there's a a true record of account for various things. One of those things is the degrees and all the other uh, tests and processes that the pupils go through. They can now say, look, this is the degree we've got. This is the college it's got. And because it's on the immutable blockchain, it is proof positive that that is there. Um, As opposed to being on a standard thing that can be changed by anyone at any point at any time. With Web3, certainly with our Web3, it means that nobody can go in and view that data unless they have access to that data, and nobody can go in at all and change that data, whether they have right access or not. And only the owner of that data, in this case the pupil, is able to actually go and add to that or give access rights to it. Now, I say the pupil has ownership. They do, but they don't actually put in their exam qualifications, the teachers and the school districts put in all those, and the pupil can't change those, but they still own that record. So they can then go and give the um, view access to that record to an employee. And an employer, sorry, and that employer can then go back and check ownership, whereas that can't be done outside, or it can be, but not as easily outside of a Web3 ledger environment. Forgive my ignorance. I know very little about education in Nigeria, but is is it the case that that system is unfortunately prone to to fraud or something? What 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 are the challenges there that you're trying to solve with that? Oh, one of the challenges is exactly that. How can you prove that you have this degree from this educational establishment? How can you definitively prove that to be the point? And that is where a blockchain can come in really, really well. There is definitive proof there that at this date, you took this at this educational establishment and this was your mark. Do you see that taking off, maybe integrating into systems like uh, LinkedIn or, or the like? Because obviously um, I, my background is, is, is as a recruiter trying to verify that what someone has written on a piece of paper is accurate was not always the easiest thing in the world. It's a nightmare, as as, um, the US Congress has found out with some of their own members. Um, Yes, I do. This is where I think Web3 technologies really can come into their own. And it's that proof of record, that proof of point that something has been done. If you are the person who puts that data in, then you can change that data in a standard system. You can lie about it because you know that there's no way of proving that point. If there is an immutable object that says this person did or did not do this, 
then there is a proof point in time that cannot be changed. So what else is on the cards for Omni Index this year? You've talked there a little bit about a case study in Nigeria. Well, what else are you kind of working on that you feel excited about? Um, as far as customers are concerned, we got, uh, we're just onboarding a new customer, which is all about um, film rights, going back to proof of who is using a script, how much have they paid for this script, who's viewed this script. Again, perfect for a ledger. Um, in the technology side, we're... Actually, we have our own AI engine built into the platform um, called Boudica. It currently is what's known as a narrow AI engine. Um, in other words, it does very specific tasks. So using thesauruses, it's able to determine a whole bunch of information about your record. We're actually um, just integrating our own small language model um, into the platform as well, which we're very, very excited about. Um, what that means is that you'll have a, a Gen AI system, which is only trained on your data. Now, why that's important is that currently the large language models are trained on data that you have no insight to. You don't know whether that data is actually copyrighted. You don't know if that data is in breach of copyright. What you do know is that it's probably incredibly biased. Whereas if it's trained purely on your data all the time as your data is going in, you know that you own that data. Well, if you don't, you know that you don't own it and you're using it illegally. That's your choice. Um, but you also know that what's coming out is only about your data and not about anything else that could be coming in from the web or wherever it happens to be. And because of that, it also means that it's taking up far, far less resources to create. So large language models at the moment take up so much resource that places like Iceland and Greenland are having to be used to try and keep the temperature down. And I believe in one instance, Microsoft is uh, putting a data center in the seas around Iceland and throwing all the heat into the water. Great. Let's have a little bit more floating ice coming off the ice caps. Um, large language models are using so much power that we need to start looking and we have started that thing on creating a small language model, which to be fair, so has Microsoft done. Microsoft have announced their small language model back in December, I believe it was, because they understand the limitations of the large language models. So we're very, very excited about that for the predictive analytics it gives our systems as well as the Gen AI side. Now, earlier in the interview, you asked me if I remembered the hype cycle of an earlier technology. You, you've been in the industry for some time. You were uh, around... Get. Sorry? <laughs> I'm an old git. I yes. wouldn't have phrased it quite like that now, but <laughs> look, you, you were around for the for the dot com bubble. Um, yep. You were a CEO during the credit crunch, um, yep. and here we are again, coming out of the last couple of years of COVID. There's been this surge in hiring. Now people are, are, are kind of cutting back. There's suggestions that you know that there might be a bull market forming around AI. What what's your sense when you look at the technology market right now? Where do you think we're going? I think there's a bull market around AI. Um, just a couple of years ago, we had a, a bull market for investment around SaaS models. Um, you know, if you had a SaaS model, then you could get billions of dollars of investment. And there was only one reason for that, and that's the same reason there's a bull market around AI currently. And that is because the, the large vendors, and they won't thank me for saying this, make huge amounts of money out of you using AI massive amounts of compute resource goes into the AI. So the more money that goes into AI companies, the more money that the cloud vendors make from the backend infrastructure, which is exactly the same as a SaaS model. The more SaaS vendors there are there out there, the more money that the infrastructure companies make. And there's no coincidence that those two go hand in hand with the amount of investment that's going into them. Yes, it will burst. This is a bubble. Um, and unlike SaaS that just fizzled out on the investment side, I think this will, <clears throat> this will burst. Um, SaaS is a thing that can carry on and it's a proven technology. Most SaaS companies end up being just resellers for the infrastructure company. That's all they are. Um, the classic one on that was um, Uber, Dropbox, even Dropbox before them. 
So most of Dropbox's investment went into paying their AWS fees until they started creating their own data servers. AI is the same way. Most of the money that AI companies make will go back to the infrastructure providers to pay for the servers that they're using. Because there is only so much that AI can actually do, regardless of the hype, at some point, people are going to realize, and that is going to burst a bubble, and you will see a lot of companies go under at that point. And this is where I'm really concerned for AI, because I do believe AI has got a huge future. Um, if, if you look at um, DeepMind from Google, they're doing some amazing things with their AI engines when it comes to genome testing, when it comes to new drugs for diseases. When you look at some of the startups creating an AI pillow to help you sleep, I mean, the term BS just springs straight to mind. You know, who needs an AI-instructed pillow? Nobody. Yet they're getting funding. Why? Because it's got the term AI in it. Once it's realized that actually there's no way that that company is going to make money, but it is making a lot of money for their infrastructure provider, once that's realized, then things will start to go wrong and people will say, well, AI is not doing what it's meant to do. It's not up to the hype that we've been, we've been proven. And I think what we've got to remember is why was OpenAI created? OpenAI was created basically to increase advertising revenue for Microsoft in Bing. That's what it's there for. Microsoft and Google make their money through advertising revenue out inside the web browser and in the app stores. The more they can train that model to target you specifically, the more you are going to buy because the adverts that you're getting are more targeted to you. That is what they were designed for, and that's what they're doing a really good job for. They can also help create emails and the like. But beyond that, your standard Gen AI, a little bit limited, whereas true AI, which is what the likes of DeepMind and others, Microsoft, their own labs, I don't know them as well, but what their labs are doing is incredible and isn't getting the attention that it should be because the noise is all around Gen AI and how it can write an email for you. I have to say, I, I saw the AI uh, pillows uh, at CES. I <laughs> accidentally got grabbed as I was walking past the booth and was yeah. funneled into this thing. And I thought, I move around far too much at night for this. It looks like you have to stay very still for it. <laughs> I just, I, just, I mean, call me old-fashioned, but I just don't get it. No, I, I agree, I agree. Sadly. Yeah, I must be getting old. <laughs> I'm there with you on that. Um, look, last, last point then. Um, what question do you have when you get together with peers and you're not the one being asked questions what question do you have right now that you think that's what i need to know the answer to without being facetious the question that i i mean i asked this question a couple of weeks ago at a, a session was give me a use case for a large language model that is in production Simple as that. Well, I certainly can't answer that, uh, but you nor, never know. Could, nor, could, nor could they. They gave me an absolutely fantastic use case, awesome use case, real-world use case. I won't go into it because it'll, it'll tell you who the company is, but it's a really, really good use case. Uh, when I asked them, is, is this use case going forward? Will the company be doing it? They said no, because there's no business benefit for it. Hmm. It's been a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you very much Thank for your you. time. And uh, fingers crossed we might cross paths at another conference at some point this year. Thank you very much, David. Right, George, you, you said you listened to this this morning as of the time of recording. Um, Simon's, Simon's, what I like about this interview is he's very forthcoming with some opinions. Um, he's not going to sit on the fence on this stuff, right? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was great to hear... You know, somebody who clearly understands the, the area of the area of business, their passion, in all things Web three and uh, blockchain uh, and non fungible tokens and immutability. But obviously, Simon has got a you know a, a firm foundation across a range of technologies, and it was really good to hear his viewpoints on the you know the much wanted Gen AI bubble, which will eventually burst, which is a bit cyclical. There have been a number of these boom and bust the dot com and 
uh, a whole bunch of other things that have happened over the last uh, few decades, particularly in the technology industry. So it was good to hear somebody with an opinion. <laughs> Yeah, and he was quite strong in the fact that, you know, AI might mess it up for themselves. You know, the, the, the hype is being generated by by people selling AI because they want to sell it. So they're going to tell you it's an existential threat because it sells it more. But then, as you say, that's just going to kind of contribute to a bubble. Yeah, and and, and clearly, uh, as um, he's kind of alluded to in terms of Web Web 3, and that's been around as a terminology for some time and was on the Garden Hype cycle and has been in the Garden Hype cycle for, for some time. I think there'll be a normalisation, the sort of the, the, the get rich quick um, kids on the block uh, will quickly go away, the money will dry up, but the actual core value of Gen AI will be found in the next couple of years, a bit like he alludes mm. to in the in, in the interview for Web3 and you know, Web, now is the time for Web3 and blockchain actually. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we've had the whole Kate Middleton thing mm. in the news and I watched, obviously, there was all of that hype online, conspiracy, wild conspiracy theories going on. And then they released the video of Kate talking, I thought, very openly with a lot of vulnerability about her condition and explaining why there'd been that, that vacuum. And most of the media, it seemed, went, okay, back off. This woman needs some privacy. Lots of people go through this disease. Um, you know, let's let's show some some compassion. But then... There does seem to be a part of the internet that's going, yeah, but that that yeah, but video is—is is that really her? Is yeah. it a deep fake? And you're like, my God! Like, part of me, my, my the revulsion is like, back off! The poor woman is not well. Like, what are we doing? We're just like eating ourselves here. But at the same time, I suppose there is that wider point that how do you trust what you see? How do you know what you're watching is real anymore? I I think in the case of Kate's video, it is. But because of what's going on with AI, it is important to be able to say with some veracity, this is this is what it says it is. And blockchain, you know, to Simon's point about this being 2024 being the year of blockchain, that's where you can see real real uses for a ledger and verification yeah. being super important. Uh, yeah, so you, you're 100% right, Dave, the... the... There's a, and as I said, I think there's a bit of a demographic issue here as well in terms of uh, younger people being uh, less e trusting and less trusting in equal parts. So I've had that, yeah, this conversation in the household and about all of that around about Kate Middleton and state-funded, you know, fake media and all sorts of things going on. And there's this lingering doubt about everything. Um, and, and, and that world where we live in a degree of uncertainty and AI has introduced a degree of uncertainty, not of AI's doing, but more about the hype around it, right? Let's to be clear. Then we, we, we do we do increasingly need that kind of level of trust that we can put in to the things we see and, and do in the way we transact. And that's where I think, you know, Simon and the, the products he was talking about, you know, are very practical applications. I've got to say, I'm, in a previous life, I actually worked in higher education or related sectors. And one of the hardest things we had was proving that a student actually had a degree from the university they actually said they came from. It was typically about a mm. paper and it was typically scanned. It was tri triple checked and there was no service that we, the organisation we worked with could, with absolute certainty, um, prove that that student was indeed had that degree. What Simon was talking about in the work he was doing in Nigeria and the school data was exactly mm. the thing that we needed um, and would have saved us a significant amount of time and effort and manual intervention so uh, you know when, when he when he when he says it web web 3 is is then there is a time for web 3 i think he's not far wrong to be honest on the point of you mentioned nfts at the top yeah i i fully agree with you with regards to i think the nigeria example really concrete example where you can see value and it should be something that's just in education full stop and it makes you know will make things a lot easier. I have to say, when it gets to things like NFT, I begin to switch off a bit. And I don't know whether that's me being, um, I don't know, cynical, ignorant. I had, a, I had someone come up to me at a conference a little while ago talking to me about NFT art. And I couldn't have been less interested if I tried. I, I tried to be polite. Yeah. It's just like, what is, the, what is the value? What is the point? And I do worry that some of that, damages 
the really good stuff that you're seeing with Omni Index and and the education in Africa because it all just gets in Nigeria because it all just gets lumped in the same boat. Well, I'll just get, yeah, and and um, you know if you think about uh, Web three and uh, when you look at the actual NFTs and and the maths behind it and the you know general you know the the, the distributed ledgers that makes complete sense. It's to your point, it's the it's the applications that are being used. Um, you, you know you. The idea of it being applied to to art and digital art is, is is in some people's eyes sort of not relevant, but there are very relevant use cases for it. So I think mm. the war is on to make sure that the the real difference that Web three and generative AI can make to the world at large somehow the truthful has to find its way, you know, it, its way through all the noise. I think, but a lot of these um, new technologies and new paradigms they do go through a bit of a growing pain when they get hyped up. And then there's a bit of a kickback, uh, and then there's a normalisation. You see that happening all the time. What I would say is that as time goes on, and maybe it's maybe getting a bit older, uh, Dave, is that the cycle gets quicker and quicker. It used to be five years, then it was three years, and now it's eighteen months, and then it might be six months. I mean, they do say that technology is now technology is as much like a fashion industry as as, as anything else in terms of an analogy. It's less about manufacturing and engineering. And more about fat, you know, it's it's like a fashion industry. Things come and go all the time. That gives you and I great, you know, a great sense of we, you know, lots of things being talked about. There's always something new coming around the corner. But it, it, the pace, the pace is incredible at the moment. So, mm. ha, and I am of a certain age where I am now hanging on by my the literal coattails of what's going on. <laughs> Christ of you are then. There's no hope for someone like me. At least you understand. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Too many Saturdays and Sundays spent trying to keep up, frankly. Well, look, um, I think that's probably enough from us, uh, given it's Easter Friday, or Good Friday, rather. Um, and a lot of people, hopefully, are, are going to find some quiet time to catch up on stuff that they love. Hopefully that's this. Anyway, um, have a great weekend. George, thanks for your time. We'll be back on Monday. Thanks, Steve. Tech Talks is hosted and edited by David Savage. It is produced by Nash Squared. And we have special thanks to Lemzy for supplying music to this show. <laughs>